Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. Kamalam Dungiola and Rachel Sichali probably already know that. Um, today I have a Zoom talk. Um, um, it's women coming together and talking about protecting the reproductive health of young women. Um, so I thought I should take you along and see um, see how that goes. So please, guys, tune in and. Remember to subscribe and yeah, I will just, I will record when the meeting starts, it starts in a few minutes. So I'm almost ready, just making my cup of coffee and then we are within. So this is a network for young people by young people. So our focus is on sexual and reproductive health and rights. So this is our first virtual event once again. So today we decided that we're going to just invite only women as speakers to share their work, to share what they're doing as well and how they are ensuring that reproductive rights are actually seen, people know about them, people know about their rights and accountability. Those are the things that we'll be highlighting today. So, yes. Um, before we get started, I would like us to take a moment to remember the legacy of the path in the words of South African History Online. On the 9th of August, 63 years ago, in 1956, around 20,000 women marched to the Union buildings in Pretoria to present a petition against the carrying of passes by a woman to Prime Minister J.D. Spredon. Organized by the Federation of South African Women, this was the famous women's march that is now celebrated on the 9th of August every year. The women's anti-pass campaign, the women's charter, and their famous march to Pretoria became benchmarks in the struggle and continue to inspire decades of women until democracy was finally realized in 1994. Women in South Africa have never constituted a homogenous group. There were and still are huge discrepancies between the haves and the have-nots. But at many times during the struggle, women of all races and all classes worked together. The bonds among women and the experiences they share, they will always have in common and will always be united through them. As we engage and learn today as young South African women, let us remember the legacy of the past, not just to find out answers for the future, but also to inspire generations of women to come. I would now like to introduce our first presenter, Nicole Bannister. Nicole is the founder and commissioner of My Basketball Team, a digital storytelling platform that is committed to mystifying relationships and intimacy. My basketball team shares short stories submitted by individuals globally about dating, intimacy, and relationships in the hopes of sparking a dialogue that normalizes intimacy and eliminates the stigma so often associated with talking about sex. Nicole is also the partnerships coordinator for the Grassroots Soccer, where she scales sports-based, youth-friendly, sexual health programming around the world through innovative partnerships. She is United Nations Alliance of Civilizations Fellow, a Returned Peace Corps Volunteer, and a Start Block Social Innovation Fellow. She manages a travel and lifestyle blog on, on Medium, and her writing has been published by the South African Airways, Opportunity Desk, DOCC, and more. Today, Nicole is going to lead us in a presentation titled Storytelling and Sex, Normalizing the Conversation Around Intimacy. Hello, Nicole, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hi there. Thank you so much, Tandi, for that wonderful introduction. My name is Nicole Bannister, and as I'm sure you can probably tell from my accent, I'm originally from the United States. But I've been living in South Africa for the past seven years, working across the sexual and reproductive health space. I founded a digital storytelling platform on Instagram called My Basketball Team. And today I'll be sharing with you my own personal journey to having very public conversations about sex and hopefully supporting you all to begin to think about how you can normalize public discourse around sex as well, both Kamo Mzanzi and beyond. So for me, it is just absolutely critical, um, you know, that we have conversations around sex um, and around safeguarding our sexual and reproductive health as women. Um, it has to be a conversation that happens in community. Women are so fiercely passionate and people and causes. Women are intelligent, women are talented, women are ambitious, motivated, and most importantly, I find that women value the us 
and the we more so than just the me. And this empathy that really like oozes out of women is one of the things I love most about us. The fact that at the end of the day, even if I'm just doing me and I rise, my entire community rises right with me because that's what women do. We are the backbone, we are the matriarchs of community writ large. And I think that's phenomenal. I want us as individual women to not only have the personal agency to shatter our own misconceptions around what a relationship is, what consent is, or what sex is, but to also bring our sisters and brothers and everyone else along with us on that journey of discovery. Let me just be the first to come out and just totally out myself on this call and say that I love talking about sex. I love talking about myself having sex. I love talking about my friends having sex. I love talking about random people having sex. Anything and everything related to the conversation around sex and intimacy just absolutely fascinates me. To me, it's one of the most natural things in the world that nearly every single person does in some shape or form, either with themselves or with partners. Yet for some reason, this idea of talking about sex is still shrouded in secrecy. It's still shrouded in taboo. And especially for women, I feel like there's this constant belief that if we talk about sex, we are promiscuous or we're not being ladylike or we're not the right kind of woman. And I want us to take those really negative, insensitive and antiquated mentalities and just completely throw them in the trash. I've spent the past five years of my career working for an organization that uses sports to teach kids about their sexual and reproductive health. And in this role, I was traveling all over South Africa and broadly across the African continent, having real conversations with young adults about their sexual and reproductive health. We would use the sports to create these safe spaces for young people so that they would feel comfortable discussing really sensitive issues like HIV and AIDS, consent, condom usage, healthy relationships, and more. Whenever I would link up with new groups of young people, I would get all sorts of fascinating questions. Like, can I as the woman be the one to ask for sex, or must I wait for them to ask me? Can I as the woman tell my partner that I want to try a new position or a new move, or will they think I'm being too forward? Can I as the woman put the condom on the man, or should he do it because the condom is going on him? Can I as the woman pleasure myself or do I need someone else there to do it for me? Every single time I was asked questions like these, I found myself responding with personal anecdotes, responding with my own personal stories and experiences across having different sexual partners. I'd be like, girl, let me tell you about this one time when I schooled my man about how to open a condom because he's doing it wrong. Or let me tell you about this one time I told my partner that we should do this position and their eyes went wide and they thought I was crazy, but we still did it. <laughs> Whenever I would share my story, I realized that I was giving other women permission to do the same. Other women would gather around us, we'd form this huge circle and they'd hop in with their own stories, their own experiences of intimacy. And it was always so refreshing because everyone was saying things they had always wanted to say and they were always thinking about. But because of societal pressures or religious beliefs or cultural values, they had never had a safe space to share or discuss issues around intimacy or around their sexuality. So that got me thinking, why do conversations about sex have to happen behind closed doors? Why can't conversations about sex happen just like this in public? My basketball team is a digital storytelling platform where I share short, sexy stories submitted by people from around the world. You can follow us on Instagram or like our page on Facebook, but we post one story a day, every single day about dating, sex, and intimacy. We are sex positive, we are pro-sexual diversity, and we are you know, pro-harm reduction, which for us really means that we fundamentally believe all consensual sexual interactions are healthy Healthy, and we encourage pleasurable experience. And at our core, we want all people and women especially to be able to engage in sexual interactions and have these conversations completely free of coercion and free of violence. We are taught to believe that there's this like pornified version of sex, but that's not the reality of everyday intimate interactions with partners. Whenever all of these different things happen in our lives and in our sex lives in particular, 
it is okay. This is the reality of intimacy and it's absolutely critical that we share our experiences so that young women just like us know that these things happen and that when these things do happen, it's okay. I just, I truly believe that when you share your story, when you share that unique experience that happened to you that was super funny or super sexy or super spontaneous, you shine light on a path for other young women to do the same. We need to talk about sex with our friends, our peer groups, our sisters, our parents, and especially our partners, so that we protect ourselves, so that we have clear examples of healthy relationships, so that we know exactly what it should look like when a partner consents or doesn't consent, and so that these conversations move out from behind closed doors, from behind the shame, from behind the stigma, and step out into the light. Happy Women's Month, everyone. And once we as women start speaking about sex, we give the confidence to those who, for instance, might not have the same confidence, and to actually free ourselves up and open up about these experiences that we're having. So thank you very much for that conversation, Nicole. Next up, we have Ruby Kazi Sanfela. Ruby Kazi is the founder and executive secretary of Born to Shine Youth Development Agency, which is based in the rural town of Alice, Eastern Cape. She is a full-time volunteer and an active citizen, as she is passionate about the community development and youth empowerment. Her motto, treat and respect others as you would like to be treated and respected. She is an active change driver, a leader, and a literacy ambassador. Today, Ruby is going to be talking to us about access to sexual and reproductive services, as well as information. Thank you so much for being here today, Ruby, and we welcome you to take the floor. So when we're speaking about SRHR, um, we're speaking about sexual reproductive health. I'm sure you have been in many of the clinics in your community when you go in, you find a sign that says that this is a youth-friendly clinic. But when you look around the house, you don't see any young people, or you do not see any young nurse that is going to be able to attend to young people. Those, they, those, those youth-friendly services that are in the clinic are supposed to be met by young nurses who can be able to speak to young people and be able to talk to them without judging them or without um, parenting them when they are sick. You see, when you're a young person going into a child, going into a, a clinic, you are going there for services. So young people, when they're being assisted in these different um, sessions, they need to go in and feel safe so that they can be able to talk about what they need assistance with and then they can get the information that they need without feeling in any way, without feeling as if they are being judged when they are there. So I would just like to encourage young people to ensure that they become part of these um, youth-friendly facilities in their clinics and clinic boards so that they are working. Thank you so much, Fubi, for that very important talk and opening the conversation on accessing sexual and reproductive health and rights services. In order to safeguard our health, it is important that we as young people are armed with the necessary information so that we can make informed decisions with regards to our bodies, our health, especially our sexual and reproductive health. Thank you, Kluby, once again for joining us. Intabi has always been passionate about advocacy and activism since a tender age and has come to understand the fundamental dynamics as well as principles that are such a responsibility. However, above all, she has always loved the spotlight, which is mainly the reason why she has ventured into the field of entertainment, media, and radio. She is by far the youngest MC to have ever made big waves in both the corporate and pageantry spectrum. She believes in the power of dreaming big and is a true example of the future belonging to those who believe in the beauty of her dreams. She has hosted numerous prestigious events and award ceremonies in her journey which some include the second annual Mpumalanga Book Exchange Picnic in 2020, as well as the Mr. and Mrs. China University of Technology in 2018 and 2019. There is absolutely nothing that gets her blood and adrenaline racing as much as being behind the mic. She always aims to please and serenade her audience with her vibrant personality. And today she's going to be doing exactly that through sharing with us some of her poetry. Welcome and thank you, Ntabi. Please take the floor. On this beautiful day, you open the drums of your ears and lend me your time as I take you through a journey, a journey of who 
I am. Listen and listen carefully. Pretty woman wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or bold to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them, they don't believe me, they think I'm telling lies. I say it is in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step and the curl of my lips. I am a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please and to a man, the fellows stand or fall down on their knees. Then they swan around me, a hive of honeybees. I say it is in the fire in my eyes, the flesh of my teeth and the joy in my feet. I am a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. Men themselves wonder why they love me so much. They try so much, but they still can't touch my inner mystery. And when I try to show them, they say they still can't see I say it is in the arc of my back, the sun of my smile, the right of my breast and the grace of my style. I am a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. Allow me on this beautiful day to extend my sincere greetings on this beautiful day as we commemorate the existence of women in our society. My name is Ntabise Mahasha, but commonly known as the emotional penetration on this beautiful day. See, I want to take you through a journey. I want us to have a conversation. I want to remind you of who you are. The greatest gift you can ever have is the ability to be a woman. <laughs> Let me remind you of who you are today. You went through so much in love. You've experienced so much in life, but you are where you are today for a reason. You are where you are today because God has gifted you with the ability to nurture this world. Do not let them tell you otherwise. The very same woman who walks miles and miles of miles to make sure that her kids are fed. This is the very same woman who bears the pain of labor for hours and hours. This is the very same woman who bleeds every month and still survives. This is the very same woman who carries the household on her shoulder so that her family is nurtured. Do not let them tell you otherwise. As women, we need to understand our worth. We need to cement ourselves and take up space, just as our queen has said. We need to be unapologetic about it. And for me personally, it is not about Women's Month. It is about embracing each day as it comes. It is about 365 days. It is about walking the talk. It is about going where you are and affirming yourself. Just as Maya Angelou said, I am a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. On this day, let me remind you, you are a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's who you are. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to showcase my talent, to showcase my gift. Uh, that was a poem by Maya Angelou, where she speaks about women being phenomenally who they are women embracing themselves and taking up space, just as Zosie said. And I feel it is something on this beautiful day that Siakwazi Youth Network has orchestrated for us. We need to remind ourselves of, we need to go back to the drawing table and really sit down and think, who are we? Why are we here? More especially because we find ourselves facing the pandemic of gender-based violence. More especially because we find ourselves trying to prove our worth in workplaces. More especially, we find ourselves in households trying so much to actually fit in. But this is one time where we need to remind ourselves that we are very much worth it and we don't need any validation from any other person. It's important to things into existence. Whatever that you speak of, whatever that you put forth, whatever that you voice out is what actually comes into reality. My name is Antavi Sembaha. Next up, we have Yolanda Rachel Siflali. Yolanda is a filmmaker who graduated in film and TV production techniques from City Varsity School of Media and Creative Arts. She is currently freelancing as a production manager. She is also a co-founder of Sisterhood 411, functioning as a big sister, a friend, and a mentor to young girls. 
Continuing on the theme of mentorship, Yolanda is active on YouTube, titled My Sexuality is Not a Phase, wherein she shares personal stories as well as conducting interviews with members of the LGBTQIA community. Through her platform, she aims to showcase that love can never be a phase or a passing stage. Should you wish to find out more about her content, find her on YouTube using Yolanda Rachel Siklali. Today, she's going to be leading a presentation and which is titled, Call Things As They Are. And this Women's Month, may we all call things as they are. Thank you, Yolanda, and welcome. Oh, okay. I am sorry I didn't prepare the icebreaker. I just, I just can't, I don't know how to. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just going to jump straight into it. Though I'll leave you with a question that you can answer in the comment section and then I'll get back to it later. Um... The question is, why did the turkey join the band? Or in South Africa, why did the chicken join the band? I'll get back to that later. Um, anyway, I decided to call my topic, um, call things as they are, because I feel like... Okay, let me just step back a little bit. I'm a storyteller. So most of the things I do are based in storytelling. So um, even the discussion that I'll be leading now will be based on storytelling. So I'll basically be telling you a story of some sort or another. Um, so I thought of this topic, calling things as they are, because we grow up and things are always sugar-coated and not as, yes, okay, not as what they should be. So perhaps the more we call things as they are, the more people are able to feel comfortable in having such conversation. Um, in particular, I'm talking about the woman body. When you're talking to a child, um, I'm just going to make an example before I get to what I'm talking about. Um, there is this um, TikTok video that I watched. I'm so addicted to TikTok. But I watched this video on TikTok where um, this guy was talking about when you are raising a child, a toddler, and then um, the language you choose to use with them is very important on how they react back to you. So he, he, he made an example about spilt milk. And um, so the toddler goes to the kitchen, she's thirsty or she's hungry, and then she, um, she when she's pouring the milk, she obviously spills it. And then the mother, there are two types of mothers. One is going to come to the kitchen and shout at the child because she spilled the milk. And then when the child is being shouted at, the child will um, go into a shell, be nervous, be shy, and then not be able to tell the truth. And the truth being, I spilled it because I'm hungry or I was trying to pour myself something to drink. Then there's another parent who's going to come into the kitchen and realize that there's spilled milk. Um, which is anything that can ha it can happen to a child, but now instead of shouting, you just mention, but oh, so good to take a EBs. Mm, let's let's wipe it. What was happening? Instead of shouting, now we are having a conversation about this milk. So the child now can easily say, I was hungry. I I spilled the milk because I was trying to pour for myself. You see, the dynamics of it now differ because the child, there was room for the child to actually speak out instead of being lashed um type saying if you could please mute your sound um there's a room for the child to actually speak out anyway now we take this and then bring it to a tod i mean a teenager um say your teenager um going back to calling things as they are like particularly a vagina because we are talking about reproductive health here particularly calling a vagina a vagina and then opening up discussion in the fact within the household that children are able to say mama my vagina is growing pubic hair or there's hair in my vagina i don't know what's happening or i the the child starts menstruating because the conversation was so open in the household it's it gets easier for the child to be able to speak out and there's this thing that our parents always get to tell us when I, um, me personally both when I was growing up that um, you should 
you should stop playing with boys as soon as you start with your periods people tell you your parents tell you stop playing with boys um, because you will be pregnant that is not the truth and um, the sooner we, we tell the real truth and explain to kids, Bana, listen, this is what happens when you start having sexual intercourse. And this is what happens when you um, play with boys in this way. Instead of just saying don't play with boys, imagine now a girl who has always been with brothers and boys all her life. Now all of a sudden when they start their periods, they told stop playing with boys or you will fall pregnant you know so calling things as they are for me means tell the child what exactly you mean so if you're gonna tell someone stop playing with boys because now you've started your period why why must i stop playing with boys why is it why is it such a taboo for me to play with boys what in what activity is it what activity is happening between me and that boy that is going to make me fall pregnant because I've played with boys all my life. And then the second thing that makes me say call things as they are is that um, when, you know, when a child is told by their mother, um, don't um, eat that chocolate. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make you sick or, or whatever. Don't, um, don't go there. Obviously, um, you know chocolate is nice. It's tasty. It's delicious then your mom tells you don't eat it so basically then you find a perpetrator um who probably wants to do something to the child and the child has been told to not allow the boy to play with the nunus they don't tell them Bana, don't touch the vagina they say don't don't allow the boy to play with your nunu because if they play with your nunu um, it's dangerous. Then the perpetrator is gonna tell them your mom is the same person who's told you um, Not to eat chocolate. So don't you think your mom is just trying to deprive you of the good things in life? You know, but if you call things as they are you you, you allow the conversation to to You allow you you open a conversation between the mother and the daughter um, to you get what I mean. <laughs> I want to talk about um, periods. The The reason I wanted to talk about periods is that we things happen. A friend of mine actually, I was having a conversation with her telling about uh, about this talk yesterday. She told me Ubana, she actually had a scare when she thought her tampon got lost inside her body because she was drunk. Um, while she was on her period and then she th she thinks she forgot to take out one tampon and put the other one so she thought she put a tampon on top of another one so now yeah now she's in her 20s but now I want to take this back to umdu on a, um, to a teenager say a 16 year old who's wearing tampons and then this mistake happened because maybe she woke up and she's still very drowsy um she just realize that she is overflowing or whatever and then because she's still half asleep she wears another tampon on top of the one that she's wearing now we know that um it's because we don't call things as they are at home we struggle to tell our parents things like mom i think i misplaced my tampon inside my body you know so then it becomes a thing like then she will struggle then her reproductive health is threatened because if a tampon is going to get lost in your body, it will rot, things will happen. I don't know the full info about it. But if you are afraid to go to your mother and say, Mama, I think this happened. Can you help me? We are even afraid to say to our parents, can you help me take it out? Because I think I put a tampon on top of a tampon. Um, it hurt me to hear someone in her 20s being unable to say this to her um, to her mom because she's afraid and i'm thinking if a 20 something year old is afraid to talk about such thing such things then how is a 16 year old going to be able to say these things if we don't normalize talking thing talking about things as they are and if you like you're you're very old and you are still i feel like our parents are still in a box of some sort they are unable to talk about that some things because they've been taboos in their family i'm sorry there's so many comments but i can't read them while i'm talking so i will <laughs> i will try i will try um 
it's, it's, it's become such a taboo um, to talk about things that um, I lost my train of thought now because of this comment thing. Anyway, so we try, like we we we. We, we need to be able to talk straight with our parents about everything that goes on with our body because if you remember this is the same person that was changing your nappies this is the same person that was wiping your ass when you were a child now this vagina that you are afraid of talking about to them is the same vagina that they were wiping when you were a baby i know it's grown it's changed a lot of things has happened have happened but you are the same body that she gave birth to you are the same body that she breastfed and then um okay and then I want to then talk about pregnancy, since we're talking about reproduction here. Teenage pregnancy, and I don't know how much time I still have, but be feel free, Tando, Tandy, to tell me when you're running out of time. Teenage pregnancy, guys, like I, I was pregnant um, when, I was a, um, when I was very young and I had an abortion. If you want more about that story, I've told it on my YouTube channel. But um, when it comes to teenage pregnancy, and reproductive health i feel like we need to be able as parents because i feel like women my age are parents now i would be a mother of a teenager now if i didn't have an abortion so women my age have, are, are, are parents to teens so we need to normalize giving children options now when i was 14 the only option was i had the only option i was given was abortion and we need to understand that our parents and us as parents now we need to stop projecting our pain into the child because at the end of the day you my mom even said to me Umana, your father's family is gonna be i don't know what they're gonna say but she was concerned about what they would say but who's this guy he left when i was six months old so why do i care what he has to say but i mean um so she was more concerned about what his family is gonna feel what his family is gonna say about the fact that i fell pregnant at a young age when she also fell pregnant at a young age so now she's projecting what she went through on me instead of protecting me from the pain that she felt so let's normalize of giving people options the abortion is an option i'm not against abortion as much as i like as much as i wish i didn't have it but i'm not against it but we need to understand that keeping the child is also an option we need to understand that giving the child up for a adoption is also an option so when you give a person one option and you know, as a parent you give your daughter or one option you are still projecting onto them what you want instead of trying to find out what they want so basically what i'm saying is let's normalize talking about everything let's normalize having people understand mana there's not one way of doing things there are options and things can turn out differently because you as a parent you fell pregnant young and then you were confused and then you didn't have anything to like you didn't know what to do when you had your child but you still had them and now your child is pregnant it's not about you anymore it's about them so let's stop projecting our feelings and our um, and, and what we went through to the child um because say i had my child and she 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 would be probably 12 or 13 now so say i had her and then a few years from now she falls pregnant what what, what am i supposed to do now to tell her Bana, i um i suffered be when i had you so now you can't suffer when you're having a who knows her future who knows what plan what plans she has i mean we are living in the 20 don't don't century is it the 21st century it's 2020 things should be normal it should be okay to talk about things with our parents i am 27 right now and i still have things i'm unable to talk about to my mother because of because of projections that she has put upon me when i was growing up i remember um when i started having shave bumps and you know what like i'm menstruating um i'm I, i'm having pubic hair younger and and i had a shave bump and i looked down i'm like oh my god what is this and then i struggled with myself because i was like um you don't learn and what do i do with it and it's scary 
especially the first one you have it's scary then I go to my mother and I'm like mom I have this thing in my we can't even say vagina but because I'm trying to normalize saying vagina I said I didn't say vagina to her obviously but I said mom I have this thing on my vagina it's a bit painful it's a bump and I'm showing it to her and then she's like hey, we're gonna look now I'm gonna what is pubic hair? What does pubic hair have to do with shave bumps? Okay, now the topic of the day is protecting reproductive health hair, right? So now if we say say now I had okay fine I did have the abortion. 20, 12 years later, I'm thinking to myself, I want to have a child now. I'm nervous because I've had an abortion and I went through a depression stage and I couldn't go back to the clinic for cleansing and everything and everything. So so now I'm having fears um, of being able to have a child and I'm sleeping with a woman. So obviously I'm not just going to fall pregnant. I have to plan it. Um, so these are the things that I should have been able to think of when I, I was told to have an abortion. I should have been told if you have an abortion, this is possible. You could possibly, you, it's possible that you won't be able to, to have a child when you decide to have a child. So you still, you need to understand. And I had my abortion when I was five months pregnant already. So imagine, it was an illegal route that time. I think you can legally have an abortion at five months now, um, but then it was illegal. So imagine, had I known then that it could, po it could po I could possibly not be able to have a child in my adult life. Do you think I would have had that abortion? I don't think so. Anyway, um, I asked you a question at first, like I, like I said, if anyone is interested in getting to hear the full abortion stories and everything else that I talk about on YouTube, it is there. Um, I asked you a question um, in the beginning, I said, why did the chicken join the band? I don't know if anyone um, answered. I don't know if anyone answered, but the answer is it had the drumstick. Drumsticks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for watching. Um, thank you. Whoa, I'm so YouTube-y. I'm watching it, guys. I think that's about it for me. I will read the comments. I can't read them while I'm talking. But thank you, Tandy and Imam Lang, for the opportunity. It's great to be here. And I'm still here. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much, Yolanda. I love that. Just in case anybody missed it, why did the chicken join the band? It is because he had the drumstick. Thank you once again. And thank you for emphasizing just how important it is to start calling things as they are and what they are. Calling things as they are is, the, is one of the fundamental steps in making an informed choices, staying informed and taking ownership of our sexual and reproductive health. May we take lessons learned from Yolanda and call things as they are this Women's Month. Our last speaker for the day is Lusapo Khachaneni. Lusapo is a student, uh, is a student, she is an educator, she is an HIV and gender activist, she is an MC, a panelist, a peer educator, and a mentor. Rosapo is currently studying towards a diploma in clothing management and textile technology at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Rosapo works with uh, NGOs and startups as a project management consultant. With 15 years of experience as a peer educator and mentor, she is very passionate about female reproductive health, access to education, as well as facilities and resources. She advocates for consent and women's rights to safe sex. Today, she'll be leading us in discussion during which she talks about my body, my choices. I think part of responsible reproductive um, sexual health starts with really knowing your body. So women usually deal with a lot of things, being breast cancer, uh, fibroids, cysts in 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 the um, in the vaginas and the uterus. So um, these are very delicate matters, and often these are only discussed once you're older. You say you want to have a pap smear, and you're usually told that you have to be at the age of 26 or older. And some clinics will tell you that you have to be older than 30 
or have had a child in order for you to have a free pap smear. There are some uh, clinics um, and pharmacies that will have um, breast, um, breast cancer as well as um, pap smear screenings at a cost. But um, mine is always to encourage young women that as soon as you are sexually active, make um, visiting your doctor mainly for your sexual um, reproductive health, um, a priority and a thing that you do at least once a year. Being um, consent is always freely given. Consent is reversible. Consent is informed. Consent is enthusiastic and concern is specific. So oftentimes, um, people will ask, um, what is consent? Um, consent basically is me giving a go ahead to, to be part of a sexual act. So whether you are a female uh, having sex with another female, whether you're a male having sex with another male, or you're a female having sex with um, um, a male, it should always be, um, it should always be, enjoyable and enthusiastically so. So any sort of um, sexual contact without consent is illegal. Uh, it doesn't matter what, what the age of the person is. So sometimes people will be in a position where they will be, they will be with their partner, they're initiating maybe foreplay, but the partner is not resisting and otherwise not saying anything um, and so they're not saying yes, but they're not enthusiastic. So as a partner who's very aware of what's going on, you should pull back just to make sure that you're still in the same, in the same topics. And, and remember that when your partner doesn't want to have sex with you, it's not, it's not really a reflection of they don't mind you're attractive or they've lost interest in having sex with you. There's usually something deeper or it's just that it's, it's not a sex day, you know, and can you be with that person without really having sex? And so for us ladies as well, it's important to respect our partners as much as we would like them to respect ourselves and definitely, um, do visit your health clinic, your nearest pharmacist, and have these discussions. I'm just like all the other speakers. I'm always about talking about sex, about everything, including my own sexual life. Um, thank you once again, and happy Women's Month to everyone. I would just like to emphasize the last few points that you made, which is that consent is informed, it is enthusiastic, and it is given. And it's important that we always respect each other and respect our partners as we journey down sex and intimacy and explore within that intimate bubble. I just want to say thank you to each and every single speaker as well as the attendees. We had an amazing talk today with such amazing and necessary topics and I'm happy to have everybody here to share it with. From Jordan, we have a comment saying that we need more talks like this. I agree, Jordan. Thank you very much for that. Awesome. Thanks, Tandi. Um, my question is actually for Yolanda. I was so inspired by how freely you're able to speak about a number of different, you know, experiences that you've had in your life. And I find that oftentimes, you know, women and just people in general really don't feel that that sort of comfort and ease to be able to share, you know, such intimate things about themselves. And I was just curious around sort of what you know, what is it that sort of motivates you or inspires you or sort of allows you to to speak so freely in this way so that the rest of us can really try and emulate that? Um, hi, Nicole. Thank you. Um, I don't know, like, I can't, there's no straight answer to that. But I think when I was younger, um, I was part of a group called The Cabinet and we shared, we, we, we had a slogan called um, I Have a Story, my, my Story Can Change Your Life. And um, through that, we would tell stories like I do now. And through that, I learned that I get more healing that when I tell other people, it's gotten to the point where um, when I share my story with other people, they get more emotional than me ever because I'm so over it, not really over it, 
but like I've grown from it. And I'm learning that whenever I share my story with other people, I remember when I shared my abortion story on YouTube and this girl, I, I found her, I, I had a friend request on Facebook and then I'm actually chatting with her on WhatsApp and she was like, listen, I had an abortion a few weeks ago. She's 17 years old. She's like, I'm just like last month I had an abortion and I've been looking to find someone I can talk to who I question and we have conversations about it all the time and she feels that she needs to talk and those are things, the things that um, empower me and inspire me to keep talking about things like that because um, we are breaking chains from we are breaking chains um, that other women are experiencing because at the end of the day what you're going through is you, you, you're you not the only one. There's, okay, I, I, I almost said there's nothing special about you, but there is. But honestly, you are not the only one. And you might feel that you are the only one until you tell someone. And until you speak out or until you hear someone else talk about it, and then you realize, well, actually, this is, um, this is something that's real. This is something that's happened to other people. And um, this is very empowering to other people that I'm able to share it with other people. Yeah, I just like... Um, I just would like to inspire the, the, the women that are much younger than me and maybe older than me to, to, to be able to understand and feel and go through the emotions and understand it's okay to feel, it's okay um, to not want to be here, it's okay to go through whatever you're going through because at the end of the day, you are not the only one and other people have gone through what you're going through. Thank you so much for answering, Yolanda. Uh, in the chat box, we have Jordan asking, or saying rather, that during high school, she did not receive good sex education, and therefore she was wondering, how can she stay safe, and what, and where can she find more information regarding these threatening diseases? Um, hi, Jordan. Um, that's a very good question. Well, that's true, because I think usually with um, high school education, it's very on the top and doesn't give you the list of all the 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 diseases that you can come across um i'm, I'm more than willing to give you a, a few resources but the internet is always full of everything um but of course usaid is one of them that has a list uh, of of anything that you could possibly um that you could you um, um i mean <laughs> He, he aids, it's H-E-A-I-D-S. Um, it always has all the resources that you need um, on STDs, HIV, and overall wellness. But um, another site that's very easy to access is Planned Parenthood. Um, it's an American website, but it has literally everything that you could possibly want and, and any question you could probably possibly ask about um, reproductive health and STDs and all of that. And um, you know what, it's good that you you have the, the test done and it's not an easy conversation to have with partners because people have not yet normalized um, STD tests and they're often very, um, they're often expensive as well. Um, and, and so I, I often say to a partner, and especially if it's a new partner that, you know what, it's important for us to both know where we stand because you might say you don't have a disease and you know your status, whether it's HIV, herpes, um, gonorrhea, syphilis, HPV, and there's all these other diseases that you cannot see, touch or feel. And whether you're a female or male, it affects your body differently. So I often say, I know where you stand, but I don't, you don't know where I stand. And I believe that it's a great thing that we, before we jump and actually start having sex, let us actually make a, a conscious decision to plan a day. We will go to a clinic of choice or a doctor of our choice to actually get these tests done. And I often say to partners that even though we get the test done now and then we'll get our results, even after the test, we must always use condoms because that's that that's the that's the best thing that you can do for both of yourselves, for each other, you know. And I mean there's different there's finger condoms, there's dental dams. Hello everyone. We seem to have lost Lusapo. Um Nicole would like to take over and just re respond to Jordan's question with regarding to asking partners for an STI check. 
Hey everyone. Yeah, hopefully Lusapo will be able to join in again. Um, but I totally, you know, echo everything that that she shared. The other thing for me too, and that I often say to partners directly, um, is that safe is sexy. You know, for me, when I um, oh sorry, I see Lusapo is back. Do you want to continue? No, definitely. You can definitely jump on. Um, but I was just saying that all these different types of condoms that are available that we can use if you are running away from getting the test done. And some people say it's not fun, but as you're saying, um, safe is sexy. So I, I love that as well. Yeah, totally, totally. So yeah, for me, it's like, I actually feel more interested in being intimate with someone when they do ask questions about STI tests and checks when they do ask for consent, you know, straight up asking for it instead of, you know, just sort of like, oh, we were in the mood and, you know, whatever, you know, being very explicit about those things to me is actually a turn on because I care about my sexual health. I care about whether or not my partner cares about their sexual health. So for me, I, I similarly always ask partners um, and I'm seeing the comment here about being in a committed relationship. I am rarely ever in committed relationships and often intimate with people outside of committed relationships. And for me, even if you are a casual sexual partner, for me, I still feel like we should be, we should actually even be more motivated to have real and honest conversations about sex and safety and things like that when we are casual. Because I don't know what you're doing with who and you don't know what I'm doing with who. So for me, it's like, okay, cool. Let's have a real talk conversation. If you feel comfortable enough to want to be inside of me, then I think we can have a conversation around <laughs> Who else, you know, you've sort of been, uh, been, been dealing with. And so I think it's so important to really just ask people straight up because, you know, at the end of the day, like if we can't have these open and honest dialogues with people, then are those the people that we really want to be intimate with, you know? So, so for me, safe is sexy, consent is sexy. One of the most like the sexiest moments I ever had with a partner was when he asked me, and it was someone who I had been with before, but, but one time, you know, he comes over and he says, he goes, okay, can I, can I hold you? So I was like, okay, sure. And so, and you know, he had been, I'd been with him before, you know, I, I, I had given him a yes already. And he was like, can I hold you? I said, okay, sure. And then he asked me, can I kiss you? So it was like at every single step of the moment, you know, he was asking for this consent. He was asking, you know, if I was comfortable or not. And I just thought that was, you know, really, really, it's, it's something that I think about often when I think about conversations around consent and, and testing. Um, so that's, that's just my, my two cents there, building off of what Lusapo. Thanks to Nicole so much for explaining consent. I think that's what we really need to like emphasize on, on what consent means. So I mean, one of the chat box that was um, one of the messages that we got so Nicole if you can please um, elaborate more make sure that people understand what consent means or what it looks like and so on so to Lusapo as well also please chip in if you can and Yolanda and what consent is about and what it means so that we can and that will be our last um question or note. So let's just quickly speak about consent and then we can close our session. I don't remember who said it, but um, there was someone who mentioned um, when you're in a relationship with someone and you don't want to have sex. Um, and then some, sometimes people often find that weird that we are in a relationship, we've been dating for however long, and then now a person doesn't want to have sex. How? What do you mean? We just had, had sex yesterday. So consent um, still applies even within a relationship. People need to understand consent is me saying, yes, I want to have sex. Um, no, I don't want to have sex right now. And me not having to explain myself to you that I don't want to have sex today. Um, consent has to do with me saying, okay, fine, you can go down on me now but um then coming back tomorrow and saying not today um so consent is basically permission um, i think the simplest way to say the simplest word for consent is giving permission and if you're not given permi given permission it is rape um we need to understand that you can be raped by your partner as much as people think it's it's not possible i was raped by my boyfriend um a couple of years ago 
um, and we were dating, we were in a relationship, but I can safely say he raped me because I didn't want to do it. So consent has to do with me allowing you to do what, what you want to do with my body and me saying, yes, you can do that. No, you can't do that. So um, I, I love how um, Yolanda said that basically to put it very simple is that consent is permission, permission to have sex, permission to engage in, in sexual activity. I think it's just permission, uh, permission to, 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 to be part of sexual activity so um as nicole said it that it was it was um it was a turn on when a guy said can i touch you you know can i kiss you and i wish every partner we had would do that because it would make things so simply um because sometimes that's something that we don't often think about sometimes you you find yourself um in you've got chemistry with someone, you're in the space, you kiss this person and things are going very fast, but you don't really want to be there. Like you haven't really caught up with what's going on. So consent is saying, yes, I'm alert, I'm awake, I'm an adult. Um, I want to do this. I want your body against mine. I want my body against yours or your part inside mine or not. And um, I can consent to, kiss, to kissing you, but I might not consent to you touching my private parts, you know? And that's why I, I said that um, consent, consent is reversible and um, it can happen now in the moment. I might say, I think I've, I've made up my mind. I wanna sleep with you, but I changed my mind for some reason. It could be, you know, I wanted to have sex with you before we were gonna be intimate and you didn't wanna use a condom. And now I don't want to have sex with you because you refuse to use a condom. And, um, you know, there was a lovely campaign a few years ago about consent and it had videos where, you know, there's the hand and it's going and it's touching, you know, it's smiling and, and, and it's touching a breast and the breast is completely not having it, you know, and it had different body parts. It had, the, it had um, a bum and a penis and it had this penis chasing the vagina and the vagina like running away and stuff. And that's often what happens and why people find themselves in, 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 in the bedroom, you know, you're with your partner your body so because sometimes here's a serious thing that people uh, take for granted our bodies respond differently you know our bodies respond to touch and sometimes someone will say oh but um you horny you turned on you you're breathing heavy your your vagina is wet or your penis is hard how come you don't want to have sex with me the body might want to but your 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 mind and the rest of your will does not want to and so when i say no i mean no and and whether that no is a soft no or it's it's a shake of my head it's still a no and by by continuing to pressure me into that and you are indeed committing a crime and it is rape and it is sexual assault so it's something that's very serious um, that we need to talk about more and um, one other thing is that I can consent to having sex um, safe sex so we having sex we have we're using a condom and right in the middle of the act my partner decides that he's going to take out the condom you know um and I have and, and I have experienced this firsthand and I've had to tell him stop we are not continuing, we are not gonna have this. And it's like, wow, what's wrong? But we, I said, no, we will not continue having sex because you've chosen to take away, to take out the condom. And now I no longer want to continue with, with this act because we need to discuss what just happened and you need to know how serious it is, you know? And, 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 and this is where we have to consistently stand up for ourselves because my partner is like, we've been dating for years. We know our statuses. We, we go for um, STD, STD checks all the time. So what's wrong with us um, not using condom? And I'm like, well, you can't really just come and change the game up on me mid, you know, mid situation and um that's also it's there's a term for it it's called stealthing you know and that is something that is something that's illegal other people have have taken their partners to court for that so um no one can can do no one is allowed by law to to do 
any sexual act on you, with you, without your permission. So it has to be implicit. It has to be enthusiastic. Yes, I want to have sex with you. Yes, I want you to touch me. Yes, I want you to kiss me. So it's it's freely given. It's not coerced. It, it, you're not shamed into doing it. Um, so if you don't feel like your your heart is in it and you, you're not giving it freely, that is not consent. If you can't say, if you can't change your mind and someone's not letting you change your mind, it is not consent. Um, it's informed. Why are you doing this? You know, um, uh, and definitely enthusiastic and specific. So that's where I'll end it right there. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. LinkedIn, it's Partners in Sexual Health. Please do like follow us on LinkedIn as well. Instagram, see ya, Boise Youth Network because we can. And we also are on Facebook. And then we can take a picture. So everyone, let's take a picture. Please drop your Instagram and Twitter handles. We're gonna take a photo just now. So if everyone could please turn on their videos. Yeah. Ready, exciting. We'll be doing this soon. Cool. So Emma's gonna direct us and taking this photo. I don't see everybody. <laughs> Hi, Babalo. Your guazi, your video is off. Can I turn other people's videos off? Great. Okay. Great. Moses, you are up. Shana, you are also up, but we're going to go ahead and take a picture. Okay. One, two, three. Start. Oh.